We're indeed grateful to have Brother Lester Camp with us. Known Lester for a long time and known him to be a man of integrity, and faithful to the cause of Christ and the declaration of the truth and defense of the same. He was born in Huntington, Indiana, taught high school mathematics for five years, then began preaching full-time in July of 73. He preached for congregations in Indiana, Missouri, Louisiana, Ohio, Kentucky, Texas, Colorado, North Carolina, and is now in Colorado. He is, uh, has written for numerous brotherhood publications, including the World Evangelist, Bulletin Digest, Gospel Advocate, Firm Foundation, Christian Bible Teacher, The Gospel Journal. Has Did you, you continue to the faith out of that? Mm, mm, mm. Has, <laughs> go ahead and sit down. We'll get somebody. <laughs> has spoken on numerous brotherhood lectureships and has conducted meetings in 11 states. He's directed the annual Gospel Journal Rocky Mountain Lectures, when it was worth having and directing, has written a weekly newspaper column for several years and has spoken on a weekly radio program for a number of years, served as editor of In Word and Doctrine for over three years, was founding editor of Matters of the Faith for seven years, was director of the School of the Bible and the College of the Bible in Madisonville, Kentucky, for three years, and serves on the faculty, of, or served on the faculty of the Houston College of the Bible, as originally we were known, now the Truth Bible Institute here in Spring, Texas. Presently preaches for the Piedmont Church of Christ in Denver, Colorado, and uh, works for, or is that Rata? Which, <laughs> and works for the ADT Security. We're grateful for his presence. We want him to come and deliver his lesson on Christ confronted error about himself. Thank you, Brother David. It is a delight to be here in this assembly tonight and to uh, be involved in this great lectureship. For months now, I have looked forward to this occasion. Uh, from where I live, there are very few faithful Christians with whom I can have fellowship. And so I've been looking forward to this occasion to have fellowship with you fine Christians in this locality. I would solicit your prayers in our behalf as we try to grow a congregation in Denver. And if you are traveling that way on vacation, we would appreciate a visit and your encouragement while you're in the area. We are struggling to make headway and to evangelize in our community, but it is increasingly difficult with the liberal philosophy, not only in the churches of Christ in that area, but in the city, in the city and state, uh, John Denver's song about uh, Rocky Mountain High has recently taken on new meaning. <laughs> so we appreciate your prayers. I appreciate the congregation here. I realize how much work is involved in putting on a lectureship. I'm especially grateful for the women of the congregation and for the food that has been provided been staying with uh, the Ross this week and know that Burnell's been in the kitchen most of the time that I've been there. And uh, I've enjoyed some of her fine food since we've been there. Appreciate Brother David and his stand for the truth, uh, the good elders here, um, the recordings that are being made of this lectureship will do a world of good in many places, in our small congregation, at least once a month, we view a video of some sort that is instructive and helpful and faithful to God's word, and no doubt we'll be using some of this material at that time. Christ was the great controversialist. He perfectly exposed error wherever and whenever he saw it. One author stated, he allowed no theories 
no systems or customs which have to do with human destiny to go unchallenged. Nor was there anything languid in his manner or method of attack. He went on to say that Christ is the most persistent, alert, resourceful, and masterful controversialist of all ages. I believe that to be true. And I believe that the theme of this lectureship is a great one because we need to understand if we follow the Lord, the Lord was involved in controversy in confronting and exposing error of all kinds during his earthly ministry. And as I said, if we follow him, we'll do the same. Another writer states, we never find any indication that Jesus failed to meet a challenge once it was thrown down. He accepted the conditions laid upon him. There are even indications that he entered into these discussions with a kind of holy zest and dealt with the conflicts. This could only be because he recognized these controversies afforded him valuable opportunities. It afforded him the opportunity to first of all discredit the false teachers. And these false teachers today need to be discredited. These false teachers who claim to come to the people with the authority of Moses and the prophets, but who were unable to hold their own in a battle of wits and words with our Lord, not even to substantiate their claims in a fair argument. Secondly, it gave him the opportunity on many occasions to drive home a practical spiritual lesson into the minds of those that were standing by who would listen to the conflict of these experts with zest and would not be likely to forget the details of what was said on either side. These controversies sprung upon him unaware and without warning. First in the synagogue or perhaps at a feast or by the wayside and he would talk to the multitudes and he was unprepared as far as realizing in advance what would be discussed, though he knew the hearts of men. But he was never at a loss for what to say in self-defense or even in a retort. In 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15, we're told to always be ready to answer to any man with a reason concerning the hope that is within us, yet with meekness and fear. Finally, another author states, the result of these controversial encounters was twofold. Number one, it shook public confidence in the scribes and the Pharisees while enhancing his own authority with the people and with his own disciples. And secondly, it drew forth from Jesus some of the brightest and most characteristic utterances. It is not till we examine carefully into the question that we realize how true this last remark is. The record of the controversial sayings of Christ occupy an astonishing large place in the Gospels. Embedded within these controversies, these discourses, these discussions of Jesus, are what one author calls gold nuggets and rough rocks. Certainly tonight we want to look at a, just a few of these gold nuggets in these rough rocks in order to see the example of Christ as a, an unsurpassed controversialist in our example. In a world full of error and evil, the only real solution is the advancement of good and truth. Using the example of Jesus, we cannot afford to be silent. We cannot afford to refuse to confront and expose every false way. It is stated in Psalm 119, 104, Through thy precepts I get understanding. 
Therefore, I hate every false way. On the banner behind me are the words contending for the faith. And below that is this remark regarding this very passage. Those of us who love the truth and hate error will always be willing to contend for the way of God. And I say that without shame or without reservation. We need to understand that it is our God-given responsibility to love the truth and to hate every false way. And wherever and whenever it happens, we have a responsibility to involve ourselves in controversy by contending for the faith. Again in Psalm 119, 128. Therefore I esteem all thy precepts concerning all things to be right. And I hate every false way. If there is a passage that we need to hold before our minds at all times, these are two passages that would fit very well. It is therefore ridiculous to think that truth can be advanced without engaging in controversy with error. Our Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ, is the embodiment of the truth. He could not do that. He is our great example, and we are to follow in his steps. In the time that is mine tonight, I want us to look at least at two examples where Jesus confronts error concerning himself. The first of these examples has to do with Jesus' very identity. In Matthew chapter 12 and in Mark chapter 3 and in Luke chapter 11, the account is given with regard to the false allegation against Jesus as being in league with Satan. As a side note, I want us to understand as we look at these three parallel passages, that the sum of God's word is truth. And therefore, as we look at these three places, we compare those things that are stated and get additional insights into the situation that is described by these gospel writers. On this occasion, a man was unable to speak or see because of a demon that was uh, within him and he was brought by some to Jesus who was in a house surrounded by a multitude a crowd according to Mark's account was that was so large that a meal could not be served when the man is brought to Jesus Jesus cast out the demon and the man immediately could see and speak the miracles that Jesus performed were proof of his divinity his Messiahship. In John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31, John said, Many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this book, but these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ and that believing you might have life in his name. I want us to understand that the purpose of the miracles that Jesus worked was to prove his divinity and his messiahship. They were that proof that was needed to convince men of who Jesus was and is. In John 14, verse 10, Jesus said, He that is God the Father doeth the works. So it was God working through him. Then we're told in Matthew chapter 12 and verse 23, and all the multitudes were amazed and said, Can this be the son of David? Their speculation was based upon the evidence of this miracle that was perhaps, that perhaps Jesus was the Messiah, the son of David. They stood amazed because of the miracle. But some, namely the Pharisees and the scribes, were so prejudiced in this 
that they could not come to such a conclusion or even accept the very possibility of this being the case. They were in a dilemma. They could not deny the miracle, the evidence of who Jesus is. For the multitude had all witnessed that miracle. All that was possible for them in order to maintain their position against Jesus was for them to allege that Jesus' power was not from God but from Satan. In Matthew chapter 12 verse 24, But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, This man doth not cast out demons but by Beelzebub, the prince of the demons. This allegation was clearly and conclusively answered by Jesus. His first argument was this. In Matthew chapter 12, verses 25 through 26, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. And if Satan casteth out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then shall his kingdom stand? Jesus observed that they well understood that in the kingdom of darkness, Satan ruled over his demons for the accomplishment of his evil purposes. If it was the case, Jesus reasoned, that the devil had permitted Jesus to have power over these demons, that he had cast out this devil, he was at war with himself. Furthermore, the kingdom of Satan was divided against itself and would not, therefore, be able to stand. His second argument, in Matthew chapter 12 and verse 27, Jesus said, And if I by Beelzebub cast out devils, by whom do your children cast them out? Therefore they shall be your judges. In this, Jesus confronted them with the fact that according to their own appraisal, the Pharisees knew some, perhaps of their own number, who had cast out demons. And they, the Pharisees, had acknowledged that these individuals had done so by the power of God. Our Lord's reference to them was not merely for the purpose of presenting an ad hominem argument, but it, no long, it does not imply that they exercised any real power over the demons. He was simply putting himself in their position and trying to reason from their viewpoint in order to show the falsity of their ideas and their thinking. Jesus' work was similar to that which they had approved of among their own disciples, among their own people. And they thought, with regard to these other individuals, that these individuals were casting out demons by the power of God. The argument, therefore, was this. I have already shown you that it is against reason that Satan cast out Satan. And now I show you that it is against experience as well. The only instances of disposition of demons which you can cite are those of your own disciples. Do they act by the power of Satan? They therefore shall be your judges as to whether you have spoken rightly in saying that Satan cast out Satan. So wrote McGarvey with regard to this matter. Why then, if they recognized on other occasions that this power that they claimed, or some that they knew claimed, had come from God, then why would they now accuse Jesus of casting out demons by the power of the devil? Their own words condemn them. Then Jesus made a third argument. He states this in Matthew chapter 12, verses 28 and 29. But if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is come unto you. Or else how can one enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods except he first bind the strong man and then he will spoil his house? Jesus declares in this that he has entered a strong man's house, that is the body of the man possessed by Satan. 
His goods, referred to by Jesus, are the, is the evil spirit that possessed him. Jesus shows that through this, that he is stronger than Satan. The man clearly now speaks and sees. The miracle, therefore, declares indisputably that the kingdom of God is coming to them. Thus Jesus put to shame the Pharisees and caused the divinity of his miracle to stand out in clearer light than ever before. The power of Jesus to dispossess the demon was one of his most convincing credentials, and its meaning now stood forth in true light. The power of God was upon Jesus. And the proof of his divine power was obvious. They should all accept what he taught because his words came from God and his power as well. The second example that we will look at tonight is the authority of Christ, which comes into question. The example that we're looking at comes from Mark chapter 2, Matthew chapter 9, and Luke chapter 5. And in association with this, we'll also look at an example that is very similar in Matthew chapter 21. In this example, a multitude again surrounds Jesus while he is in a house healing. In fact, there was no room in the house at Capernaum where he was located. While he was there, according to Mark chapter 2 verse 2, he preached the word unto them. Four friends of a palsied man bore him to the house where Jesus was. Because of the crowd, they took him to the roof, removed the tiles from the roof, lowered this lame man down on his bed before Jesus. When Jesus spoke to the man, he surprised everyone with his words. He said, Mark chapter 2 verse 5, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. According to Mark chapter 2 verse 6, certain of the scribes, and Luke chapter 5 verse 21 adds to that, the Pharisees were present and reasoned in their hearts on that occasion. Why doth this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? Jesus knew their thoughts and responded. Wherefore think ye evil in your hearts, Matthew 9, verse 4. Mark's record gives, Why reason ye these things in your hearts, Mark 2, verse 8. Reason in this statement suggests deliberation by reflection or discussion. That is, they had thought this through according to their logic and reason based upon their preconceived notion that Jesus was merely a man that he that he was therefore guilty of blasphemy in claiming the prerogative of forgiving sins. The Pharisees were not faulty in their logic on this occasion, but were mistaken on their premise. Hence, Jesus did not deny their doctrine. He merely corrects their mistaken application of it to himself. Jesus propounded his law in the presence of those most interested in exposing it if it were false, and most able to explode it had it not been true. Whether his words were truth or blasphemy was a controversy between Christ and the rulers from that day to the end of his ministry. The scribes and the Pharisees were right in their conclusion but wrong in their assumption of who Jesus was. The evidence presented on this occasion by Jesus would force them, if they were genuinely interested in the truth, to the conclusion that Jesus had the power to forgive sins because he had the power to restore health to the body. Jesus reasoned and demonstrated his logic. Mark chapter 2, verses 9 through 11 whether is it easier to say to the sick of palsy, thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, arise and take up thy bed and walk, but that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins, he saith to the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, arise and take up thy bed 
and go thy way into thine house. The enemies of Jesus had concluded that it was an easy thing for Jesus to claim to do something that was beyond the realm of verification by the senses, like saying, your sins are forgiven. According to their logic, anyone could claim the ability such as forgiveness of sins, and no one would be able to determine whether such was the case or not. But they thought Jesus was unwilling to attempt to work some miracle in their sight because they would be able, therefore, to determine the falsity and the pretense of Jesus. They, quote, knew healing this man of his physical ailment would be impossible. But Jesus knew their thoughts and demonstrated before them proof suited to their own reasoning. He had the ability to work the impossible both in the realms of the unseen and also in the realm of the seen. He could do the impossible in the physical and temporal realm as well as in the spiritual. Jesus had the ability to do the impossible and he demonstrated that on this occasion, he could heal the sick and he could forgive sins. Upon the word of Jesus, the man immediately took up his bed before them. The miracle was obvious to all. It was not done in a secret place. It was, in fact, done before some of his fiercest enemies. Mark tells us, they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, We never saw it on this fashion. Mark 2, verse 12. They had never seen anything like this before. Jesus knew the skeptics, and he knew their logic. He did not cower from them. He did not accept their conclusions. He did not remain silent. This began the open differences between our Lord and the powerful religious leaders of his day. He openly showed his authority over both the earthly and the spiritual. This conflict ended at Calvary. His authority was also questioned in Matthew chapter 21. Our Lord on that occasion was in the temple... The chief priests, the scribes, the elders of the people, probably a reference to the Sanhedrin court, were also there, according to Mark 9, verse 27. Jesus was teaching the people and preaching the gospel, according to Luke chapter 20, and verse 1. The religious leaders raised an important question in hopes of presenting Jesus with a situation which would lead to him being shown as an imposter and a blasphemer, so that the people would turn away from him. They asked this question. By what authority doest thou these things, and who gave thee this authority? Matthew 21, verse 23. The things referred to in that question were those things that ranged from the procession into Jerusalem, the healing he had done, and now to his teaching in the temple itself. Jesus responds with a question for them. By this question, he showed their inconsistency when they raised their own question. He also employed this approach to show the connection between himself and John and the existence of only two sources of authority, heaven or men. Jesus makes use of a valuable tool in teaching, a well-thought-out question, and Jesus states it this way. I will also ask you one thing. Which, if you tell me, I likewise will tell you by what authority I do these things. Matthew 21, verse 24. His question was, the baptism of John, which was it? From heaven or of men? Matthew 21, verse 25. Jesus answered them according to their motive. They were not looking for the truth, but for a victory over Jesus. It should be noted that the opponents of Jesus conferred upon themselves, among themselves, not because they wanted to ascertain or speak the truth, but according to the record, they were merely deciding what to say. They were seeking for the most expedient answer, 
and as neither truthful answer was expedient, they resolved to falsely deny any knowledge of the case. Their dishonesty could be dealt with by openly and fairly answering their question. Their response was, in fact, a lie. They state, we cannot tell, Matthew 21, verse 27. But the reality of the fact was that they were, in actuality, expressing, we will not tell. The truth was that they realized their own dilemma. And according to verses 25 and 26 of Matthew 21, they reasoned with themselves, saying, If we shall say from heaven, he will say unto us, Why did you not then believe him? But if ye shall say of men, we fear the people, for all hold John as a prophet. And so they took the easy way out. They denied knowing anything about the case. So Jesus therefore replies to them, Neither tell I you by what authority I do these things. How readily the subtle minds of the Jewish people would satisfy or justify Jesus in thus declining to submit the question of authority to judges who at that very moment publicly confess their inability to even hazard an opinion much less to render a decision as to the authority of John the Baptist, whose claims were in popular estimation so obvious. It was plain that however well these men might judge human credentials, the divine testimonials of a prophet or of the Messiah were above their carnal sphere of abilities. Thus Jesus put his enemies to confusion and settled the question about his own authority. These examples that we have looked together at tonight could be multiplied many fold. Christ certainly confronted errors about himself. He had those around him who refused to accept the abundant evidence of his authority, his divinity, his messiahship. These individuals largely made up of the religious leaders of the day would often seek the opportunity to question his authority and roll publicly in order to undermine his influence. But each time, when they did, the result was the opposite of what they saw. Jesus the Christ stood his ground, refuted their arguments. He did not remain silent, hoping that his opponents would simply go away. He did not shy away from opportunities to demonstrate the power of truth and to expose error. He was the great controversialist. The only antidote for evil is good. And the only antidote for error is truth. The world is so crowded with evil and error that few who would advance good and truth must be both a reformer and a controversialist. Peter, Paul, John, and the rest understood this and would not be forced into silence by any threats or punishment. Bearing witness to the truth in this error-ridden world is a business of strenuous belligerency, not of dignified silence or masterly inactivity. We stand at the foot of the cross tonight. And our sentiments are exactly those of the centurion who said in Matthew 27 and verse 54, Truly this was and is the Son of God. As we consider the evidence of who Jesus is and was, we must conclude that he is the Son of God, the Savior of man. He is offered by God to man for the sake of the forgiveness of man's sins. The only avenue through which we might have the forgiveness of sins is through Jesus. Through his sacrifice upon the cross for our sake. For his, through his shed blood that was given to cleanse man of his sins. And that sacrifice of Jesus is available to each of us tonight. If we've never claimed 
as our own that sacrifice of Jesus. If we've never rendered obedience to the gospel of Christ, we have an opportunity tonight to do that very thing. We need to believe with all of our hearts that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. We need to repent of our sins and confess our faith in Christ before men. We need to be willing to be baptized, immersed, buried in water by the authority of Christ and for the forgiveness of sins. If you're not a child of God tonight, you need to be one by doing those very things. But if you are a child of God tonight and have been unfaithful to the Lord, have allowed sin to come into your life again to separate you from the Lord, you need to repent of that sin and ask God for forgiveness through prayer. If we can help you in those two things tonight, we ask you to come. While together we stand and sing.